is up, my real estate friends? Joshua Smith here with today's top agent interview, where I bring you strategies, systems, lead generation, tips, and more from top realtors and entrepreneurs that exist on the planet today. The agent we have on today is an absolute rock star. 276 transactions at $37 plus million dollars per year in production. He has over 1 million views on YouTube, 17 plus thousand fans on Facebook, has been featured in US Today, is a best-selling author, and known in Myrtle Beach as the media expert. So make sure you've removed all distractions. We talk about this every single interview. There's no such thing as multitasking. Remove all distractions, be engaged, taking notes. Make sure you're listening. And again, be engaged, take a ton of notes as the information you are about to receive does not exist anywhere else on the planet. Today, I'm stoked and honored to have this amazing realtor and amazing friend of mine to the show, Jerry Pincus. Appreciate being here and uh, thanks for the opportunity. Looking forward to getting into it. Yeah, man. So, so honored to have you. Um, you know, before, before we dump into it, because I know we got so much just amazing, badass content to cover here today, um, let, let's talk a little bit about what you did before you got into real estate and, and kind of, you know, what was that journey like that got you into this business? Okay, I'm going to go back a little bit further. I'm going to tell you that during high school, I was pretty much just about high school. There's, there's not any education here. I mean, they just had to burn the school down to get me out, you know. But uh, during high school, I was a stock boy in a furniture store, and I learned a lot of uh, business, I guess, from two brothers that were in there, and they were, they were uh, growing. It was a growing business, and so one day when they had the sale, they said, "Get the kid out of the back and uh, put a tie on him and put him out on the floor, and because we need help, we just need to write this stuff up." So they put me out on the floor, and uh, the next thing you know, I started selling furniture, and um, uh, they told me that th that was going to be my full-time job. Don't come in and you're not loading the trucks anymore. You're not loading the furniture up. So that's how I kind of got into business world, I guess. But uh, at making good money selling furniture, um, at the uh, age of 21, I was living at home, had socked up some money, and uh, decided to this harebrained idea was I was going to open up a furniture store. So uh, no budget, low budget. You know, I had spent every nickel, every dime just getting things together. So, so this is kind of where the marketing part of my business uh, learning came from, um, was because I basically had to do it. There wasn't an option. Um, so, you know, I'd open up boxes of furniture, and I'd, the box would be empty, and I'd stack it up on a shelf and make it look like I had more inventory than I had. It was just about making yourself look bigger. And, you know, at night I'd go out and make free delivery, and the reason for the free delivery was because the inventory was coming from the floor. I just didn't have it. Um, I went hand to hand combat out door to door, you know, handing out flyers after hours after the store was closed. And um, you know, after a while, after doing the hand to hand combat, people actually started recognizing me, and, and it was like branding, I guess. But I didn't know what I was doing at the time. Was you know, I was out there, and people would come by and they say, "Oh, hey, what's your specials today? You're the furniture store, right?" So they already knew me. Um, then, like Halloween, I had a. Uh, clown costumes that were on sale um, at the at the local store. So I bought some clown costumes, put the kid out on the front, and he's waving. The, we were giving out balloons, and just kind of turned it into a carnival atmosphere. And uh, the next thing you know, um, this business started growing and started ballooning. And um, you know, it's in, in sales and marketing, it's all about getting attention. And what I didn't know at that point in time, but learned a lot later, was that was what I was doing is just getting attention. So uh, haven't really worked for anybody since I was 20. I had multiple businesses, um, and over the past 30 years, been investing in real estate. I bought my uh, first duplex property at 21, uh, doing some rental management, that sort of thing. And you know, my part-time job became my full-time job when it when I started accumulating some properties. I said, "Well, let me get into this real estate thing." So that's kind of how I ended up doing what I'm doing. Yeah, awesome, man. So, so <clears throat> what uh, what was the deciding factor to get out of the furniture? I mean, I know you were managing properties. Um, but what was that transition like, getting out of the furniture world to uh, to the real estate world? Sure. Um, so in furniture, uh, it's it's a pretty similar industry um, where uh, I guess you have the – well, it's, it's similar in some ways and it's not in other ways. But um, what happened was things were made in China, as everybody knows. Everybody's – the manufacturing has gone overseas. And so when I had the furniture store, I was 21 to, I guess, 26 or whatever. And then I saw these, uh, I still stayed in the furniture industry, but I kind of grew into the wholesale end of the business. And that part of it is really similar to the real estate world, why 
you know, you have people who are um, in their, you know, independent agents, they go out and they sell product and you work under a company and it's kind of the same thing in real estate. We all do that. You know, you get a broker in charge, you hang your license, you go out and you sell some, some real estate. But um, the, the uh, and, and, but the only difference is, is I was selling furniture stores. Now the reason for that thought process to me was, is look, these stores, rather than me selling one couch, one sofa, one bed, I can go out and sell a whole truckload to a furniture store and it's residual because these people are going to constantly be buying. So that was how I got into that. I ended up um, at, at one point I actually had five different factories I had worked for at the same time. Um, I, I had a, uh, um, a factory with 350 employees that manufactured dinettes. Um, I had a, a sales team that was out. We covered pretty much the East Coast. I sold the Navy. I sold the Marines. So we were really killing it. And um, again, everything's made in China. So all along, you know, investing in real estate, this was, I was living in, in, in Virginia at the time and I had some properties in, at the beach and I had some properties in other states. So I was like, you know what, I'm just really not having any fun with this anymore. It's just about having fun and uh, the margins were getting slimmer and it was just getting more aggravation. So that was where the light switch went for me. I just got out one, one night at dinner. I was talking to my wife and she said, uh, I said, what do you think about, you know, moving to the beach? She's like, all right, let's do it. And I was, that was it. Never looked back. Yep. No, that's awesome, man. So <clears throat> today you're in Myrtle Beach. Um, so so tell us a little bit, what, what's your market like there? I mean, what, what's your average sales price or, you know, buyer's market, seller's market? I mean, what, you know, as we talk today, what, what's what's going on there? Sure. So, um, you know, this is a little bit different market than I think a lot of markets are. And everybody thinks that their market is different, but I guess ours really is. And here's why, because, you know, people are not moving from point A to point B here. They're not moving from the east side of town to the west side of town. We don't get that movement. Here it's a tourism, it's a resort area. You know, we have we have oceanfront obviously, it's a beach, you know. So we have the oceanfront condos, there's golf uh, resort properties, there's intercoastal waterway properties. You know, you got beach houses, uh, single family homes, retirement places, you know, new construction, and we go on up to gated communities. And, um, you know, Prices, believe it or not, you know, it is South Carolina, so, you know, prices will run anywhere from $50,000 to $14 million. You know, if there are average sales price is $150,000. So you got to have a little bit of hustle. You know, it's it's contrary to what a lot of people think. Our homes, not all of our homes have wheels on them. They're not all mobile homes, you know. So <laughs> at the beach, you do have uh, communities that are uh, a little more upscale. But, you know, we only have 30,000 permanent residents here, but yet we have $14 million people who visit. So we've got a lot of people coming and going. You know, it's the, the biggest little small town and it's a great area because, you know, there's 1,700 restaurants, there's 100 golf courses, there's live theater. Um, but what we're attracting, our customer base is really like retirees, um, investors that are looking for some income, you know, second homeowners. And so it's a little bit different. Most of our clients are from out of town. So we had to develop a lot of different things for, to, to get their attention. Uh, they aren't necessarily here in town where I can say, come on in my office here and we'll, we'll chat for a little while. It just doesn't happen. And we also have a seasonal business. You know, it's like, I consider it like a tide. You know, the tide comes in, the tide goes out. But here, you know, we get like summertime, you know, kids are out of school. Everybody wants to go to the beach. Um, you know, you get into the winter, then we have, you know, snowbirds, people that are retired that are just want to get out of the weather and they, they come. So people migrate and they come and go at different times of the year. But it's... Uh, it's a great place to be. Yeah. So, um, and I know today you operate a, a, a pretty large team, <clears throat> but I know you didn't start start there, right? We all we all kind of yeah. start as individual agents, get in the business, and and uh, so you know, let, let's let's talk about that. You know, so you get in the business. Um, for, first of all, what what year was it that you got in the business? I got I got licensed in two thousand six. Okay. So it's I was towards you know towards the end of when this everybody's. I didn't have all the, the good days, you know, the good times. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I hear you. So, so 2000, but it, but it allowed you not to set those bad habits in either. Right? Exactly. So, exactly. Um, so you get licensed in 2006, you left the furniture business, you're, you're an independent agent in the business. Kind of walk us through that journey. Cause I know today before we, before we started recording here, um, I think you're up to about 10 agents on your team. Um, yep. so, so walk us through that. How do you go from 2006 independent agent, going from the furniture business to the real estate business to now having this mega team where you're doing a lot of uh, a lot of units. 
So, um, yeah, well, in 2006, I got licensed. I figured I'm going to get my real estate license. I'll do this part-time, manage some properties, do this kind of thing. But, you know, I joined the big real estate companies so that I could learn. You know, these guys have all these systems, right? They're supposed to. And so, you know, I moved into a new town. I'm in a whole new industry, you know, just like a lot of probably your listeners that, you know, that are, you know, from the outside or new to the business or struggling or haven't trying to figure it out. I have been there. So, you know, I was pretty quick learn. I, I learned pretty fast. You know, I, I implemented a lot of my trusty old mar uh, marketing uh, techniques, you know, so I could get some people, get in front of some people. But, you know, I was noticing that a lot of the agents, they just didn't have a clue about being in business. You know, they'd always, they were working for somebody. And, and you know, they'd show up for the job, but yet now, now what do I do? So, and I was noticing this. And then I also noticed the other thing that I found is a lot of agents, they like to buy the shiny objects. They're buying all this stuff off the shelf like it's a miracle system that's going to cure everything that they have when, in fact, that has nothing to do with it. It's just a, a vehicle to drive business to you. So, you know, I didn't know much about the real estate sales industry, but I did know that I needed to generate leads and I knew that I had to follow up. And I, and I also knew that I needed a system to, to work these things out. So, really, by joining that big company, I learned some things. I wouldn't say they were really the best things to learn, but I, I, I figured out what not to do, I guess, more than anything. And, um, you know, I think a lot of times I saw a lot of a lot of agents that were relying on, like, one lead generating system, you know, which is, you know, when that thing burns out, you're done. You know, what else are you going to do? So I knew a good bit about sales and marketing, um, and I had already built a team already, you know, back in my furniture days. Um, but uh, so I just needed to figure a way to dominate, how to how to catch everybody's attention, you know, and and that kind of grew my business. Um, when I started thinking like that, what is it I'm going to do? Because you know, it's about it's about attracting. I'm new to the business now. What am I going to do? I attract some people by doing these th certain things, and then then I had gotten to probably I guess it was about 2007. You know, I hit. 50 closed transactions, and I'm like, I'm like on this treadmill, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good on treadmill, but I mean, I was just, I'm just hitting it, so I'm thinking, okay, now what am I going to do here? So I knew it was with systems and leverage that I had to go to the next level, and that's when I started really looking at everything. You know, I decided, okay, what, what are, what should I be doing? What shouldn't I be doing? What's the, the most beneficial things to work on? So, um, I wanted to make sure that I learned the business, um, and, and I wanted to do every part of the business, which I did. Okay, so you know, you, you can't really learn unless you know what it is you're doing. So I, I wasn't going to just go jump out and do a team. I wanted to do every part of this, you know, every part of the transaction there could be, both sides, in and out, know what I'm doing, so that way I can teach somebody what to do. So my first hire was a buyer's agent, and a lot of people say, well, you know, sometimes it should be your admin. You hear those stories, right? So um, my my first my first hire was 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 a was a buyer's agent because I had plenty of leads coming in. It was about follow up. I just couldn't get them all. So I, I was I was at that point where I was still doing the listings and I'm I'm going to go get a buyer's agent. And then my next one was was an admin. So this is somebody who could implement my day to day. Here's the things that I need to do. Can you work on this project? That sort of thing. Then I hired another buyer's agent. And when I got to the point, and I've been to every point and you've grown your business as well so you know how this works is you know you get to that point where you have good agents in place and you've delegated and so now what do I need to do so the last thing to do that I did was I delegated my listings so I, I eventually kind of took a step and that was a big leap for me was I was going from doing all my listings and having buyers agents going out and doing them to going out and uh, just being the CEO of the company, you know, actually running the day to day, just making sure that lead flow, everything was there, making sure that everything was happening for my agents. And you know, today it's it's three listing agents, and one works exclusively. One of those listing agents works with uh, foreclosures and short sales, and I have um, eight buyers agents. I've got a inside sales associate, and she just makes the outbound calls, setting appointments, and that sort of thing. Um, my wife does the paperwork and and the, the bookkeeping, and I'm pretty much in the marketing role and, and with the help of one assistant. So that's where I am today, and it's come a long way and, you know, learned a lot and um, a lot of things that, uh, you know, you shouldn't be doing. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, you know, I, I, I talk to so many real estate agents that, you know, they want to start a team, and it seems like a lot of people today start a team out of want, not necessity. Yeah. You know, so, uh, you know, I talk to agents all the time that, you know, they'll tell me their production, they close 12 deals and they want to add a buyer's agent. 
Um, and, and it looks like you hit 50 deals, doing 50 deals by yourself before you hire on an annual basis before you hired your first agent. You know, what, yeah. what does that look like today? I mean, when do you know you're at the point? Let's say you're a brand new agent um, starting a team today. You know, would you do it different? Meaning, would you hire that uh, admin first, that TC first, then a buyer's agent, or would you would you have still went down the path that you went? And at what point should you look to start adding adding those agents? Well, I think it, when you're at the point where you, you'll feel that you'll feel that you just can't do anymore. Okay, there's you know you're spinning plates. I equate it to the plate spinner at the circus. Everybody's seen this guy, right? He's got these sticks that are up, and there's these plates that are just some of them are wobbling, some are going real good, and you're running from one end to the other. You just hit the one, you get that thing going, it's fine, then you jump back to the other side, right? So when you're at that point, you know you're just not efficient. You just can't get enough done. Okay, so that's the point where I think that you need to hire. But you know, you really need to not hire. Okay, I, I'm the I'm the reverse of of what a lot of people say. I say, do it yourself for as long as you possibly can. Then hire that assistant, hire that that buyer's agent. And I think, you know, again by by understanding all those things and getting really good and dialing in and getting, if you do it every day, you're going to get super good at it. And it's just the way it is. Um, and you need to have that experience in order to do it. And um, Mistake I see is, you know, a lot of agents will go out and they, everybody wants to start a team, you know, and and the point is, is, you know, they don't, they maybe don't have all those systems that are really dialed in, the things that you need to have in place, or, you know, they have a single source of lead gen or whatever. So, you know, that's the thing that I think that um, you really have to have in place before you can consider um, starting a team. Now, like with us, we've got. Um, We've got all these lead sources that are coming in. They they funnel into a CRM, you know, your your bucket, wherever you want to call it, you know. And then we have drip sequences that hit, and then we have you know property listing alerts that are emailed, and of course follow up calls and emails. And so I think that you know, if I as a as a uh, as a manager, I guess from that standpoint, you know, you can't manage if you haven't gotten all those things in place because there's just so many things that are happening. Yep. No. And, and when you're starting a team, you know that's that's kind of one of the biggest keys. Like you can't manage people; you must manage the systems that that really manage and empower the people. So you've got to have those systems in place. And Absolutely. definitely could, yeah, definitely couldn't agree more. So let, let's let's jump into uh, uh, marketing a little bit. Um, you know, I I know you you just talked about you have a lot of different uh, silos or areas of marketing that you're doing, and I know there's some areas that you've really helped me on on with personally with your Facebook and and. Like we talked about in the intro, I mean, you're you're, you're absolutely crushing on YouTube and Facebook. You know, seventeen thousand plus uh, followers on Facebook, a million plus uh, uh, views on YouTube. You know, so let, let, let's let's kind of dive into that. So, what what different types of marketing are you doing that are absolutely crushing it right now? And uh, um, what does that look like? Well, it's it's the part of the business that I really enjoy. It's the part of the business that you know every day this thing is changing, so you really got to be on top of it because every day something changes. But I look at this from the marketing. How did I get into it? First off, it's a marketing thing, right? It's not just Facebook. It's not YouTube. It's not a social media. It's not the web. It's not Google. You know, it's if you take I took the approaches. You know, I'm going to hit them by land, by air, by sea. You know, if you want to dominate, you know, if you want to be out there and just kill it. You got to hit them on all fronts. You you got to have you got to direct that market to you. You know you have to like a dog whistle. If you if you're out there blowing a dog whistle, you know nobody else is looking, but the person who's top, t tuned in, you know, is going to hear it. And you know you got to get their attention and and take up that space. So you know different people want to be communicated to in different ways. So some people just love Twitter. I mean that's just their communication device. You see people with a phone, they're tweeting all day long. And other people, they love Facebook. And so I, I figured I'm going to try to hit them on all these different levels. So wherever it is that they seek, you know, I want to cover it. You know, your parents tell you, you know, just stay under the radar. You know, don't get too much attention. You know, my parents, I remember the one was, you know, children should be seen and not heard. That was the one I heard all the time. You know, but in business, you got to take those risks. You got to invest your money. You got to invest your time. You know, you you got to get in front of people. You got to get their attention. So it's it's about selling. Um, it's about marketing and branding. But what I did was I asked myself, so how am I going to grow my business? How am I, you know, I'm doing 50 transactions. How am I going to grow this business? So I opened me up. That opened the idea at least to you know internet and social media because you know in that 
respect. I was the new guy. I wasn't out there. Nobody knew who I was. I had just jumped to town. I don't know a person in town. So it evens the playing field, okay? It's it's kind of like I'm coming in and people are using, they're being used, you know, they're using the social media and stuff. So I'm like, I'm going to hit some people on that end. I'm going to hit some people on uh, Google doing a little bit of SEO. And, um, you know, the thing with the social media is you got to be careful. And here's why, because, you know, people sometimes are being used by the internet or social media. And what I mean by used is they're not using it as a tool. You know, you jump on Facebook and they're stuck on the damn thing for hours, you know, and they just wasted it and it's a total time suck. So, you know, they're watching what things have been posted by other people. You know, they're watching the world go by. You know, and the goal I think is to control it and to use it and to make money from it, you know. Get your message out to millions. It's, and this is, if, if I can say anything, this is this is a great quote. You know, don't listen to the news, be the news. So, like, if I can't be on my local TV station, if I can't be in USA Today or if I'm whatever, I'm going to go make a video about something, and I can get it out there to whoever. You know, I I can post on Facebook and I can build this fan base. And you know, what's what's great about this is is when you're doing this you're communicating with people who want to be communicated on that level but you're also communicating with people who are tuned into your station okay and I, I equate it to like a radio frequency if you're driving in your car here's how many stations out there right you got XM you got you got radio regular air you know if you're not tuned into that station you know people don't it's going on but nobody knows what's going on you know they're not there but if they're tuned in and they're like-minded and they're looking for you and they're looking for that kind of you know, if they're buying something, they're looking for condos in Myrtle Beach on the oceanfront, they're going to tune into that channel. So, you know, this is the thing with um, social media that it's great is, you know, the world's different now. You know, you can create all this. You know, you can create your own TV channel. You know, you can, you can write a book. You can, you can, you know, go on Kindle and write a book, even if you wanted to do a, a quick one, you know. You can have an iTunes channel. So it's easier today to get... Um, people's attention than it has been. And so here's an example. So the circus is coming to town, right? Everybody's heard of P.T. Barnum. This guy is supposedly a great marketer, right? But just think about all the things that had to happen when when a circus was coming to town. You know, you got to go get flyers printed up. You got to go get a guy who goes out, you know, a couple of days ahead and hangs up all these flyers on every place in town. You got to make sure the wind doesn't get them torn down and the rain and the and, this, and somebody doesn't grab it and use it for toilet paper or whatever, you know. So you got all this stuff going on. This guy gets there, and there he's announcing this this circus is coming to town. And then when the circus com circus comes to town, you know they bring in the elephants. They're they're marching down Main Street. You got clowns happening. You know you got all this stuff going on. And then you then and only then can you sell show tickets. Okay, so it takes all that to happen before you can sh sell your ticket. Then. You know, you have to do all the printing and all this stuff. So it's all about the promotion, okay? So today, you know, on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube, Google, all this stuff, Instagram, you know, you can be the one out there doing this. And and so you don't have to be in front of these people. You you can you, you have to be in front of these people, but you don't have to go send a man ahead, days ahead, just to get your message out there. And um, I've got a couple things on social media that I think a lot of people, I, I, another thing I see is a lot of people do is like they'll go on Facebook and they're posting, I mean what's a realtor do? They post their listings, right? Well that's not what people are necessarily looking for. You know, you're, people are not, they don't want to be advertised to. They want to be, it's a, it's a communication. It's, it's, you, want to, you don't want to pitch all the time. So my rule to that is, is you know, 80% 80, 80 of what you're posting out there social media should be about emotions it should be about a them it's to attract and then 20% sales pitch so as an example I'll pick a day when it's a snowstorm in the Northeast and I'll post a video or I'll I'll post a, uh, a picture you know about waves and the ocean and the beach and of course that drives people nuts but it's what they're tuned into you know it's about communicating with a lot of these people um, and uh, you know it's like being out there in, in, in the ocean in a deep sea fishing and you, you've got you don't go out there deep sea fishing with just one line in the water you got two lines off the back of the boat up high and they're they're going down deep and then you got you got them on the sides and you got them 
in the back. So I mean, you're you're, you're catching from from all different levels, and uh, so I think that's that's the key to uh, to making sure that you can get out there and, and get in front of people. So um, you know, I know from talking before and, and speaking at conferences together. I mean, you're 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 around somewhere like a dollar to two dollars a lead on Facebook. Yes. You know, I mean, how, how do you get to that point? I mean, mo- most of our listeners are. They might be advertising, for example, on Zillow, paying thirty-five dollars a lead. You know, yes. so, so you know, how how do you target it in? What messaging do you do? Um, are there better times a day to kind of advertise and post than others? G- give us a little idea of of uh, you know what you do to get get those types of results. All right. Well, it just didn't happen. I can tell you that it wasn't just one day. Okay, here's what happened. I did a lot of A B split testing. So what I did was what that means is is you take two ads and you 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 see different times of the day. You you check different you check different wording. You check different pictures and that sort of thing. And what reacts? What gets the best reaction? So then you take that best of that one and then you put it up against another one and you tweak it even further to finally get the best return on that investment. And so, you know, I would say that you know it's not always. Um, I would say you know catch people when they're when it, you, they want to be talked to. Um, I, I find that like on Facebook, you know, people want to go in the morning, they hit it, uh, maybe at lunch, and then in the evening. Um, so if you're doing any postings, those are the best times. Um, but if you're if you're just looking at doing it one time, forget about it. You got to do this constantly. If you're if you're shooting a video, I see people that get, you know, all this equipment that buy the drones, they'll buy the 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 lighting and the backgrounds, and I'm going to crank out these videos. It's going to be awesome, and they're going to be perfect. And don't wait for them to be perfect. My, I mean, I've got videos out there that are pretty crappy, to be honest with you, but they convert. And why? We, because I got a lot of them, so I'm out there covering up. I'm taking up all this space, where somebody else is trying to think about. Well, I'm going to get this thing down. Do it. Just do it. You got to do it. And if you're doing it, and you do it every day. That's the key to it. Just make sure you're doing it consistently. Um, you know, nothing happens until you do it. It's you. You got to take huge, massive levels of action. You know, and get your message out there. So, do you find better results um, of a buyer lead, seller leads? Do you hit both? Yes. So here's the thing: you don't have to even pay if you don't want to. Okay. Once you build this, your fan base. You know, I didn't start and just boom. I got a, a, a two thousand. You know, fans, and then boom, I got 10,000, and then boom, I got 15. It doesn't happen. You know, it's daily over over time. Like-minded individuals who have the same thought process get attracted to you, to your page. They become your fan, or they like in 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 uh, Google. They'll become your, you know, they they like your content. They're going to constantly be coming back and looking at your stuff. So, you know, I think that you you need to. You know, get that content down. Understand what it is, who it is your customer is first off. Okay, so if my customer, uh, if I'm going after a retired customer, okay, is my dynamic going to be something that somebody 25 to 30 years old is going to like? No, it's probably stuff that I'm going to be talking to them on a different level. So get that stuff down there, and then you can go out and start doing and paying for it. It's about growing, and then when you do that, you're going to grow it. And I, and I, have, I go both ways. I go both. With listing side and and the buy side, so just you communicate to those people on a different level. Of course, again that dog whistle, right? A dog whistle analogy I used. You know, they, you blow the whistle, it's only going to work to some people. Like you're you're driving a car, you've been looking at this car forever, and you go and buy the thing, and then everybody's driving the same car. You know, it's 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 the attention. Okay, they're tuned into whatever you're tuned into. So if you you post a lot of content and don't be ridiculous, like oh I got 20,000 videos coming out here. But like, if you got a warehouse of videos and you've gone out, this is an easy way to do this. Okay, so go out and shoot, shoot a neighborhood, um, and and if you're going to do walkthroughs for for another customer, shoot a video, you know, put that thing out there, and and just constantly be doing that. Every time you look at a piece of property and you shot a video, how many videos could you have? Even if they were crappy, you'd have a lot. You'd have a huge library, and the and the guy or gal who has the huge library is going to win. So you could do this for both listing side and and for buy side. Yeah, and I see I see a lot of your posts. And, and first off, um, what is you know, I know you've got your your private uh, Facebook uh, page, but what is your your fan page? We have the seventeen thousand likes that way our listeners can maybe just go out there and kind of stalk you a little bit and see what you're sure. posting and get some ideas. 
Sure, if you just go to Jerry Pincus Real Estate Experts, it's Facebook, um, and it's Jerry Pincus, J-E-R-R-Y-P-I-N-K-A-S. Yep. No, Real love estate. it, man, and, and uh, yeah, I appreciate you supplying that. And you guys get out there and, and check it out, stock it. That's exactly what I did, right? So. Yep. Good, good artist copy, great artist steal, and he's out there you doing on a, on a big level. So, and, and and when I'm watching your stuff, you know, and and you you kind of mentioned, uh, you know, if I see some snow, and I, I saw one recently, I think, where there was footprints in the snow and then footprints in the sand, and it was kind of like, wh which would you rather prefer, um, right. you know? But then you also have uh, pictures of homes in the area, and, and I know before we talked about this too, and that, I think that's why it's so important for all the listeners to split test. Um, you talked about, hey, if I have a house um, that doesn't have a palm tree in the front, it doesn't get near the click-through rates uh, of a house with the palm tree. Right. You know. So, yeah, I mean, for wherever they are, okay, whoever whoever's doing this, just think to your customer base, right? So, what's your customer like, right? Are they do they like a palm tree, or are they looking to get out of the snow? So, I think that's the key to that. You know, it's just wherever you are, just go after and post that kind of stuff. Yep. Yeah. No, I love it, man. Um, okay. So, uh, Josh, one more thing. Okay. Questions. You just, you just hit on it and I just thinking about questions. Okay. You were, you were saying about questions and that's one of the things. So when you post, you don't always have to post pictures or, or you, if you post pictures, that's going to be your best response rate. But if you're posting, ask questions as well. Okay. Um, do you like, would you rather have snow you know, like you were saying, would you rather have uh, snow, uh, footprints in the snow or footprints in the sand? Yes or no, or just let them come out. And they will come out. That's the key to this thing is engaging them as well. Don't just throw out, again, realtors, what do we want to do? We want to post our advertising of our houses, right? You know, it's because we think in the house terms. But you got to take yourself back. What are they looking for? So it's about lifestyle, okay? So... And you say, okay, Jerry, you got it made because you're at the beach. But look, you can do this with anything. You got stuff going on in your town, in your hometown. Every week, there's something coming on. You know, there's there's all kinds of events going on. This is the reason why people want to be there. You know, just take that stuff, and and take that content and go out there. You don't want to. You know, the 80-20 rule is is 80% is your attraction. You know, it's the making people that are like you like your stuff, and then the 20% is is the sales pitch. And then, of course, you don't. Don't have to. You can put uh, your domain and a, a lead capture page, okay, and and a picture, and just direct that traffic there. You don't have to pay for that. You know, you, you'll get some free traffic, but I mean that's just a good way to get started. Yeah, you know, and it really comes down to where Facebook is really just another CRM. It's another list. You know, and our, yeah. our number one asset in this business is is isn't our list. It's our connection with that list. So I, I love the idea of. of Asking questions, getting them more engaged. Um, now, a quick question I have on on Facebook. You know, there's a big difference between boosting and doing targeted Facebook ads. Now, yes. are you are you doing a mix? Do you find one works better than the other? Um, I'm doing both. Um, I'm 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 always testing which one works. Um, the good thing with the the boost is is a lot of times you can communicate with your whoever your your uh, fan base is okay, and it's easy to do. You just click one button, you boost it, and it goes out to all your people. But you can also target these people, okay? So if you have a certain demographic you're going after, and here's what I would recommend: think about who it is that buys in whatever your town is, whatever it is that they're buying, okay? What is the type of house? What's the average house or condo? What is the age that these people are buying? What is your average sale price? Okay, so look at all those types of things, and then figure out how old that person is. You can you can target down and get into that. Now, I've even targeted down into some neighborhoods, which is pretty ninja. I mean, you get down into it, and you're you're popping up on news feeds, and they're like, how how in the world is this guy constantly hitting me? You know, but again, land by air by sea, you can do that stuff. Today, you can really focus in on who your customer is. And you know, you know, before you'd post, uh, you, you go to Google and you pay AdWords, and you and you pay for pay-per-click and stuff and just get a humongous bill and it would go out to the world and they may not even be interested in what you've got. So today, you know, in all these different mediums, and I'm just using that as an example, but there's tons of other ones. I mean, you can pay for Twitter. I mean, you can you can advertise on Twitter, which is crazy. You can advertise on Facebook. Other people are watching ads. You, know, you can show up on their ads, your competition's ads. So there's all kinds of stuff you can do today. 
And when when you're posting, and, and this is really my last, I guess, Facebook question for you, because um, yeah. I don't want to dive into YouTube here. Um, so when you're posting, what where are you driving them to? Because it, it's you know leads are irrelevant. Well, you can't get a lead without somebody giving you the contact information. So it's not you know here's so many people talking about oh I got thirty thousand impressions. This is cool. I'm like well how many how many right. names and numbers and email addresses did you capture? I mean that's really what it comes exactly. down to, right? So. Um, you got the message going out. What do you, you know, what, what is outside of the picture, you know, what kind of messaging do you put on there and where do you drive them to from there? Okay. So picture is the key. Okay. You could have the same verbiage and just even play with the picture. Obviously blue size, a blue sky, sunny day is the best for whatever it is. Okay. The second thing would be the verbiage and then the landing page. All this has to kind of coordinate together. So if you have something, your message is completely different, make sure that it's going to a landing page that is kind of in line with what you're talking about. So if I say, I picture, a, uh, I, I put a picture of an oceanfront balcony there and I'm, I'm sending them to a landing page for just generic listings, they may pop onto that page, hit that thing, and then bounce because they didn't sign up. The key to it is, is that being congruent with your marketing all the way through. So if I'm going to go do that, I'm going to send them to oceanfront condos on a particular page, usually properties. If people are looking at buyers, what do buyers want? They want properties. They don't want to talk to realtors. You know, what do realtors do? What they think we do is, you know, we just open doors for them. But the reality is that we're a wealth of information. So, you know, we want to make sure that they are in front of what it is that they're looking for. If they're looking for homes that are priced between two fifty and five hundred thousand dollars, and you're showing a house that in your neighborhood would look like that, make sure they're hand, hitting on that page because if you're just showing them, pay, you know, low end houses or even upper end houses, again, your bounce rate's high. Um, you know, and the other thing is, is your message. If you know your message and the medium you use, and also your timing. Okay, so different times of the year, you can hit different things, okay? If it's back to school, you know, people are looking to get into school districts and stuff like that, you know, just can hit on that stuff. And like what I do is I've got a book, you know, I got books, I got CDs, stuff. So I'll hit out to my fan base, you know, to, to go ahead and, and, hey, did you sign up and did you get yada yada? So there's other things that I can do to get in front of them. And just keep on with that message. Just hit it with a different medium. So I can send them over to instance, uh, you know, not on Facebook, but I send them over to my uh, my um, YouTube page. Okay, so then they can go and consume more stuff. And that's just the way you you keep your herd in inside your gate. You know, you've got a big gate and a and a fence. That's the way you can control your herd. Yep. Absolutely, man. So let, let, let's let's dive into YouTube. So you talked about sending them to your YouTube channel. You're the first, I think, realtor that's not like, uh, you know, this celebrity million dollar listing realtors or, or, or whatever it may be, or some mega coach out there that has a million plus uh, YouTube view, you know, views. You know, I know I, I put out so much content, you know, video every day, sometimes every other day. Um, but I think I'm up to, I don't know, 20 or 30,000 views. So, so how do you build a YouTube channel to, to a million views? And, and what are you sending? Like, what do you, you know, I, I know a lot of people don't want to post a, a video because, and we you touched on this earlier, because it's not perfect. Yeah. You know, so so what kind of content are you posting out there? How frequently, and how the heck do you get it up to a million views? All right, there's a couple couple ways to do this, and and first off, it's consistency. Okay, you got to be consistent with this. If you put your message out one time, and I mean, if you truly want to dominate, okay, and that's the one. You know, the one with the most content, the most leads, they win. It's just it. Everybody else kind of goes away. I've had people come in my office specifically because they saw, man, you're everywhere. You know, well, not really, but I mean, they were looking for where I was. So if you're there for whatever your message is, if you're going into a community and you want to dominate that community and you've got enough stuff out that community, you know, you you constantly be putting information about that because people there's people out there that are tuned into that channel, that radio station in their mind that are looking for that information. And so if you end up coming up multiple times for that, you know, you are the dominant player. There is nobody else. They're going to go to you. So, again, my stuff is not – it's pretty – some of it's pretty rough, I'll be honest with you. But I just got a lot of videos out there. I just pumped that stuff out. And one good strategy to do it is, is like I had mentioned, is just go out every time you look at a property – video it if you're not with a client because sometimes that you know they're not going to sit there and wait for you but if you're not selling but if you have that time and you're building go out and video as much as you possibly can now you've got this 
stockpile of video. Let's say in a day you go out and you hit a bunch of different communities or a bunch of different houses. Let's say you have 10 videos. They're raw footage. Okay, You just keep that on your computer. You can drip out after you <clears throat> play with this stuff. You don't have to have any fancy editing. You don't have to have a fancy camera. Shoot my stuff on, on, a, on an iPhone. You don't have to uh, go out and, and buy all the lighting equipment. Just go out on a blue sky sunny day. You know, don't even have to talk. You can put, if you're afraid of the camera, which a lot of people are, you know, you don't have to talk. You can just go ahead and put that stuff out there and, um, and, and put music to it. And, and uh, so you have a, uh, your, your beginning. You basically have a, a beginning with your logo or your name or your phone number, and then you do the same thing on the back end of it, maybe a couple calls to action, and you post that stuff. You drop one of those out there every other day or so, and you suddenly have this huge library. But if you're consistent at it, if you could actually even pay somebody to go out once you get this thing rolling, you know, you can you can leverage this thing. You can go out and pay somebody you know, on Craigslist and, and go pay them per video or something, or, or a college student that's looking for um, some credit for uh, you know in a photography department or whatever. You know, or even just some kid looking for for money. I mean, people will do this, and you can go out and and, and get them to uh, to to get all this content that's shot just a two minute video. You don't want to be long. You know, when when we're talking about this stuff, people bounce. When if it's if they're learning something, you got to go long because there's a lot to learn. But if you're trying to catch their attention and you're trying to direct them somewhere, it's about short two minute because people's attention span is is not that long and you want to capture it. So if you can build that kind of stuff out, you got them. You got it made. Okay, so let, let's just say you're 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 viewing a uh, previewing a, a townhome or a condo in your area for a client. <clears throat> Um, you're in there by yourself. You got your iPhone out. What what kind of a script are you? Like, just walk us through that. Like, what what, what would you say when you post it? Because I know you're probably emailing that video to your client. Um, yes. What what are you what are you putting out on YouTube? You know what 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 is okay. that look like? You can if you know that you have. Let's say you use a townhouse example. You know you have clients that are going to be segmented in your list, your database that will be looking specifically for townhouses. So you aren't going to send that to everybody. Obviously, you kind of. Try to segment your list if you can, and you can't constantly be sending your every video out to every client because they're going to opt out, and then you got no list. So the key to it is is making sure you're sending the right message to the right person, and so or, or a neighborhood, and it may not be that big. But what you do is you basically walk through the house. The first picture is the front. Okay, you take a picture. You just maybe pan back and forth if you need to. A lot of my stuff may be condos, um, so if you if you take a picture of the front and then you walk through, you do your normal room. Now you got to kind of pace yourself. You're not going to sit there and look at the ceiling fans and everything, but I mean, for two minutes, you got to pretty much be, be moving on. And if it's got a backyard, if it's got a pool, if it's got nothing, you know, kind of plan where you're going to go before you go. You don't have to be professional. And if you get in there to a bind or whatever, it's all editable and don't get hung up on the editing either. Post, post, post. The one with the most posts wins. So you go out there and you send that, and then you can talk. Okay, check out this this kitchen. Uh, this thing. Uh, let me open up this drawer right here. So if I show you this drawer right here, you know these are dovetailed, and this is one sign of a quality. If you look at it, you can point features like that out. You know, little things that nobody would see in a video, but you could talk about it. Um, one of the other things that you can do if you get if you do not mind being on camera is they have a stick that basically it's an extended arm for you. And you put it on, you know, you, and you can pan around a room and be talking while this is going on. So your face is in front of them, and they get to see you. The drawback that I see with that is, is when you're posting these things, you have three pictures that YouTube will put your face on. Okay, uh, you can choose. You know what I'm talking about, Joshua, right? The you have a choice of your your picture. Yeah, like the thumbnail. Thumbnail. Thank you. I couldn't. I had Alzheimer's there. So your thumbnail, right? So you got your thumbnail, and then if every video you have is you sitting there with their face in it, it's good, but you want to mix it up and have some variety as well. So don't do the same video every time. Now, I've leveraged it so that we're actually – we have people doing all the video. They're taking shots, and again, these are kids that are going out doing this stuff for us, or our agents will go out and do it, but collectively putting it all together and, and, and making it one. So what do you uh, so you talked about okay you, you're just shooting it with your your iPhone <clears throat> when you when you're stitching these together are you using just like an iMovie or, or what do you use to to put them together Yeah iMovie or um, just using uh, Microsoft off, uh, Microsoft uh, Movie Maker Don't you don't need to buy anything you know some people they 
they get all into the equipment again. They get into the you know Final Cut Pro. You can buy all that junk after you get a bunch of video out there. Don't buy it at first because then you got to go learn how a system works to get it to work. Just put the stuff out there. You're going to win by a landslide as opposed to the people who have bought all this stuff. Don't have the time to implement and read the instructions. Just go out and do. Let's say you make a ton of mistakes, but you win a few and you get a couple customers and clients over it. Who wins? You know, that's that's the key to the whole thing. When I, and I find, you know, I do, I personally do a lot of video too. And, uh, you know, I, I find kind of when we're, when we're not perfect on them, when we make mistakes, we, we kind of connect with the consumer a little better. You know, they're, they're, they're like, Hey, this, this guy's actually human. Right. So, right. Um, <clears throat> okay. You talked about intro and exit. Is, is there a special program you're using to, to incorporate those like a Fiverr or you just create your own? Uh, you can do Fiverr and you, that Fiverr is, you know, they'll, uh, five five dollars. People will do anything for you. Uh, you know, you can get a, a, a beginning and or an end. But I'm going to tell you that you know, for the most part, we've just taken our logo. We just drop that thing in there. Um, there's a lot of editing that you can do right within the system, so you really don't have to do too much. And at the end, you know, for more information, uh, for a free brochure, for uh, you know something else on it, for latest information on the neighborhood, you know, just some kind of a call to the action on the end of it. Also in your description down the bottom, you know, if you're talking about a specific neighborhood, send them to a specific neighborhood in your on your website. Okay, it's even better. So you're just holding on to them, you know, longer, and they'll consume more information. So if you're sending them to listings on that, what are the current listings in this neighborhood? You know, you send them to that page. Um, don't forget to put your 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 name, your address, and phone number in the bottom, and and also put in the content. Um, about that neighborhood. So, you know, don't put a sentence in there, nice three bedroom, two bath house. Okay, talk about it like you would be just walking somebody through. You know, you're, you know, you want to give the best impression of what it is you're selling. We're not, we're not clerks here, we're selling. So you want to put all that information there and sell your product. Um, and, and again, people will come back, you know, you know, this stuff works when you've got a customer that walks into the office and is starting to repeat everything you just said. And uh, you know, they're watching it. You know, you don't think it's happening, but it happens. So how, how important are title, description, and keywords when it comes to YouTube? Yep. Okay, so upload. If you really want to get Ninja on this stuff, upload your – when you do your file from your computer, it's saved on your computer. You've edited it. Change the file name to exactly what you're going to post in the, the header. In other words, go ahead and post the, the, the file name because it's going to be your title. For the, for the property. Um, and so Google has these algorithms that recognize what's what. Okay. So you want to make sure that you do that. And then, of course, add, if you want to add some views, okay, you want to post this thing not just to YouTube, put it on your Facebook. You know, you want to get some views going, make sure it's out there, send it to your people. Um, you, you can also, again, send it out to your database, which is good because that's mm -hmm. just natural stuff. You know, people are just going to constantly be viewing it that way. Now, they, you know, it's about setting some triggers, and 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 then Google will find you, and you can actually end up going into and, and being ranked in Google. You know, Google Google owns YouTube, so your YouTube videos will actually come up as a search in Google. And uh, again, they kind of when the, when they find somebody that they like, and they will constantly be you'll constantly be getting that. You get like brownie points for it as well, um, and just all the social triggers you want to hit all of them. So um, in, in the keywords, now in the keywords, are you putting property information about that property or are you putting more um, like branding yourself, your name, top, top realtor Myrtle Beach, or are you putting yeah. specifics about the property? Well, if, if it was a video that I was going after for specifically the term top realtor in Myrtle Beach, I would use those keywords in there. You don't want to necessarily use what they suggest because their auto-suggestion tool kind of is – it's it's not human. It doesn't know everything. So you want to kind of if you're going after a neighborhood, for instance, it's it's easier to go to after neighborhoods because that's probably where you're going to go. You're going to look at properties that are in a specific area. Okay, so it could be you know the area, you know, fill in the blank area, blah blah blah. Homes for sale would be you know a headline. So you would use that as one of your keywords, and you'd also use it as your um, in in your uh, description as well. With variation. Now, don't get spammy. 
because you know people don't want to hear that over you know they, they just want to make sure that they're getting the 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 information but if you look too spammy again they're gonna you'll get dinged for it and then all this work that you're doing won't won't help you a bit um, so when we talked about, about Facebook, you know, we talked about the, the picture being key. Now, do you, you, and then you talked about putting YouTube videos on your Facebook. Now, are you boosting and advertising in your, your videos? Um, or, or is it just strictly the, the pictures on Facebook? Yeah. So you, if you boost your, your videos, okay. So again, you, you're going, you're driving your number of views. Okay. And you're also, it's the social content. Basically, where is it going? Some people might, if it's something that they really like, they can share it. Now, here's where this whole thing goes when people share and it's something they agree with that's the key because then you have it somewhere else on somebody else's wall or whatever which somebody else can watch it and they may bounce back to your page and like your page so there you go you got another fan these are people that are tuned into the right station right they're all like-minded and that's the big goal the big goal is to gather as many people that are looking for whatever it is that you're going to be trying to show and sell um, and, and capture those. Yep. No, <clears throat> absolutely, man. So, um, okay. So we, we, we kind of talked about, uh, well, uh, is Facebook the main marketing that you're doing or is there other, other types that are really working well for you right now? No, we do. I, I, I've got 627 lead sources. Okay. So we're, wow. we're, we're like, I know it's crazy. <laughs> I know I'm, I'm the idiot. Right. But here's the deal. If you get one thing that's working, Believe me, tomorrow that one thing is going to get burnt out, and then you're going off to plan B. So I throw this big net. I was telling you about the fishing analogy, the fishing boat, right? You got two two big lines going out the back of the boat. They're up high and they're going deep. You got two on the sides, four on the sides, whatever it is, and more out there. How about if you threw a net out? You're going to catch more fish, right? Now, so that's my approach. Is is you know the one with the the most leads wins. I mean, I think that if you go out there and and you you go out and have a massive amount of leads, and then on top of it you have crazy follow up, you can't lose. It's it's going to happen. Yeah. So so let's let's dive into that, right? So you know, I find with so many real estate agents, leads typically aren't the problem. It's the 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 follow up process and the inability to convert those leads into appointments, which, which is yeah. always the problem. So number one question. Um, how many leads with that many lead sources, how many leads are you giving each of your teammates on, on a monthly basis? Um, and then from there, what, what is your follow-up process to ensure that you're converting these leads? Yep. I have, uh, have 52,000 leads in the database. Okay, so they're not all getting them because nobody would ever follow up with that many leads. It's just way. So we have the incubation process where they go into a, uh, an area where they get sifted and sorted and try to figure out what it is specifically they're looking for, not looking for. Are they live like today? Or are they live like I'm retiring in two years or I'm an investor looking for a property and I'll be down during the summer? So we try to figure out who it is or, or I need to sell my house, you know, where they're coming from, what they're doing. So once we do that, it's an incubation process. You know, in an incubation, you're, you're, you're holding on to them for a while and you're trying to polish them and clean them and make sure that they're, they've got, are, you, are they credit worthy? Are they, you know, what, what are you approved for? You know, all these types of things. So we, we have a, uh, you know, the drip emails, the, the, the phone calls, the follow up, uh, the property, uh, listing alerts, um, and follow up to make sure that they're getting the proper listing alerts for what they're looking for specifically, because you can really get somebody who's looking for like in a condo. I don't, I'm afraid of heights. I'm looking for, it was great. You sent me all that stuff, but I, I will never go above the third floor. You know, so how you figure that out, you got to physically have that conversation with them to, to understand what it is they're looking for. Um, so, you know, when you, when you look at it, then each one of these leads, we have a lead rotation after we figured out if they're good or bad or indifferent. And it goes out to, um, to our buyer's agents. Some buyer's agents are really good at single family homes and new construction. You know, others are really good at condos in the ocean front and they know the dynamics of every building inside and out. So depending upon what it is, we, we will send them to the per proper person. Um, but at any given point, on my team, there's never there's a, a big brother's watching. I'm watching, so I can see who's logged in, what their notes are. You know, if they're stumbling and they've got too little bit of leads and they need some more, I'll, I'll, we can we can adjust that to them. If they've got too many and they're 
they're out with customers, which is the goal at any given point to be out with a customer toe to toe because that's when the money is made. Then then I'll back off, and then all these systems in the back end are constantly following up. Um, like I've got um, an an inside salesperson that also makes outbound calls on top of our our agents so that that way there's a constant follow up. Um, so in a nutshell, it's about trying to um, it, you know make sure you have the right team members that are hungry and aggressive to follow up, but the one that also is able to follow up, and if there are any stumbling blocks, we can catch them. So you talked about the incubation process. Is that something that your ISA sets up then? Uh, my, my ISA and I have an admin. That's their jobs. Basically, they will take a look at the, the, uh, the client, what they're looking for, their specific needs and wants, set them up on a listing alert if it's necessary. If they And, you know, some of the websites that we have, they've automatically set themselves up on a, an automated listing. So, but that may not be what they're looking for. So, in other words, they, they come in and they say they're looking for something specific and never visit the area so they don't know the different areas that are available to them. You know, we have to kind of get into their information and figure out what it is they're looking for. They may have come in on a page that uh, is not specifically, they've signed up, but not specifically for what they're looking for. So they've signed up for that. Um, so my my admin will get them into um, uh, a listing alert situation, send it over to the, to the ISA. The ISA will call, try to figure out what the needs and wants are. Um, if it's somebody who's live, raise their hand, ready to go, then it'll go to the uh, the agents. The agents, once it's in their bucket, they are required to constantly be following up for it because we all know it's it's about follow up. It's you could have four leads and no follow up and no sales. You can have a hundred leads and no follow up and still have no sales. It doesn't matter how many leads you have. Right. It's about following up. Yeah, the the fortunes in the follow up. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Amen. So. So by the time your agents are getting these leads in from your ISA and, and a lot of these, you know, a lot of top, um, you know, mega agents that we're interviewing today are going to this ISA model uh, just, just because our agents are out there. They're so busy. They're out there showing homes. They can't, it's speedily. They can't get to them quick enough. They can't be on them frequently enough when they're out there showing homes for eight hours a day. Um, so the ISA model is becoming more and more popular. Um so at the point that your ISA transfers the lead into your agent, I mean, at that point, it's it's about as hot of a lead as it can get. It's just, hey, now we need to meet for the appointment. Exactly. Or set it or talk a little bit more because they may need some handholding now, okay? For instance, we talk about different areas and, you know, what their needs and wants are. Or, hey, look, I'm, a, you know, the guy may say, I'm, I'm an investor. I'm looking for this price range. And I had this crazy idea that I can spend – you know, fifty thousand dollars and get a million dollars worth of cash flow and and not have any expenses and you know it's just you got to what are they really looking for? Uh, you know, you pretty much have to figure out what it is. Give them the information, not just listings, but then talk to them about what it, what it is because you know a lot of our inform this is what's interesting about our area is a lot of our stuff is is phone because these people aren't physically here. They're not moving. They may be in another state. Um, we, I've closed deals and never even seen the guy before, you know, and sold. As a matter of fact, the same thing. I bought, he bought and sold. I've had, we've had investors that do that. And if the numbers are there, you can do this and if you're good at it. But it's all about the information. Why do they use us? They're looking for that information. We make their dreams come true. This is what our job is. Well, this is what we're here for. Otherwise, you know, look at all these other industries that are out there. You know, travel agents. You can go online and book a travel agent. Um, a trip anywhere you want to and never have to talk to anybody okay so if we aren't doing what we do best which is that local information the, the not just the not just the the good stuff but the good the bad and the ugly you know tell them the whole story that's where you build rapport that's where they work with you and no one else and that's the key to the whole thing so I mean, it sounds like your system's pretty pretty interactive with with drip systems and, and handling that incubation period. It's kind of a set it and forget it system. Um, what what system are you using for that? Well, I have it in Real Pro, but there's different sequences according to what they do. I'm using Real Pro systems. I'm not saying there's a lot of different systems that are out there that are really really good. I'm not saying that this is the ultimate. You got to go do it. So a lot of people will hear that and say, Oh, I got to go get that. It has nothing to do with anything. It's it's the way you use it. You know, and so it's just the container and what it's where they go. Um, if I'm sending in all these leads from different so and I'm sorting them and they're coming in from all these different resources, 
and I'm sorting them out as according to what it is. They're going to go hit different sequences. They're going to do different things, you know, tripwires. Um, we make offers. Uh, for instance, I had mentioned we'll make an offer for a book. We'll make an offer for a CD. We'll make an offer for these other information things that will give them uh, more information on what they're looking for without even talking to us. So it, you do have to incubate. It's not about just the system. It's about giving them content as well. Uh, so usable content that they may be interested in. So if they're looking for condos, you aren't going to send them information on single-family gated communities. You know. Yeah, and, and it gets to the point today. It's it's almost like the consumer doesn't need us to find them homes. You know, Google and right. Zillow exist, so we're we're kind of the information educational portal. And, and I love um, probably one of the first realtors I've ever ever spoken with that's really pushing these books and CDs. What walk us through that? Are they eBooks? Um, and, and what kind of content uh, are, are you sending them on those books and CDs? Well, like um, one book is a 136-page book. It is um, – you can get it on Amazon, so it's legit. I mean uh, I've written multiple books and that sort of thing. But the thing with this is is that it's a sales pitch in a book. You know, you're telling a story. It gives them a little bit more information about what they've already asked. It's common questions that people ask over and over and over again. So what I did was I put it into a book, right? So when you do that, then you kind of have, again, given them the information in a different way for them to consume, whether it's a video, a book, physical, and we mail them out. You know, um, we, we have um, – in one of the sequences we have you know, where we'll make an offer for the book, and then you just pay shipping and handling, and we'll ship the book out. Um, CD is the same way. You know, it's, it just kind of goes through – it's kind of, uh, kind of an interview style, talking about the dynamics of different things that – that things to look out for, you know, don't just give information, but what to look out for. What what are the reasons why, you know? Um, and again, it's marketing. I, you know, my background is marketing, and you know, we do use direct mail. Again, we hit them on all different areas. Just depends on how they want to be communicated with. Yeah, no, I, I love it, and especially because it's offered on Amazon. I mean, you're you're really really setting yourself up as is that authority figure in the area. Yeah. And that's the other thing is, is just, you know, again, some people, old school, they got a book. You send them an ebook. What's the value of that? You got a book in your hand, right? It's a book. I got a book. It's something physical. They don't throw this thing away. An ebook, where does it go? Right. So, sure. there's a value to a certain perceived value anyway, to a book or to a CD. People will hang on to CDs for a long time. I mean, they shouldn't. It's a piece of plastic, right? Just pitch the thing. But they'll hang on to that as opposed to just a cast. So um, there's perceived, perceived value, but then the other thing is is that in and this is a market in marketing itself, but you know, in when you write a book, you're an author, okay? And in the word author, there's the word authority. Okay, so then you become the authority figure. Now if I read this if I just did this book and I publish this book and I go to the T V station and I say, look, I'm an author, best and I'm I'm a best selling author and I got these other books out here and my latest book is blah blah blah, boom, you get in front of them. And so then they interview you as opposed to someone else. And it just is one of those things where you're all in. It just constantly is feeding itself. Oh, look at this guy's videos. He's everywhere. Look at this guy's Facebook. He's, he's killing it, you know. So it's, it's all of the cogs of the gears that come together and mesh that will create your story and your conversion. Yeah, and at the end of the day, it's, it's not reality. It's, it's people's perceived reality, you know, and… I love it, <laughs> you know. When you when you're, yeah, man, that's uh, it's pretty amazing. And it comes back to, uh, you know, kind kind of like you talked about in the furniture store, you know, the clown outfits and just being in people's faces. You know, it's, yep. it's all all this technology, all this fancy stuff can come out, but nothing replaces me in your face. Absolutely, that's you know. the way to dominate. That's it. Yeah, I love it, man. So we've talked a lot about new leads. What? Where, where, you know, where we see so many agents uh, dropping the ball, and according to NAR right now, 88% of buyers and sellers say they love their agent, would use their agent again, their agent deliver world-class service. Only 11% ever do a repeat transaction, and it's not because their yeah. agent did a shittier job over time. It's because they forgot their agent's name. Forgot. You know, yeah. so, so you know, we, I can see here that you're obviously dominating the new leads coming in. Um, what, what's, what's your process, incubation process, follow-up process with your, with your past clients to ensure you're not losing that business? Um, sure. Like your average agent. So we have a physical newsletter that goes out, okay, on a monthly basis. It's got all kinds of stuff in there, general information. 
Um, we have, I've got a van, so anybody who wants to use it for moving and that sort of thing, it's fully wrapped. It works as a billboard, goes throughout the neighborhoods. Uh, and, you know, if they're a past client, they're able to use it free. Just put gas in it. Let me see your license and registration. Our admin will sign you in and sign you out. Um, we have, um, and this is part of our, our raving fan package is when they're closed, they, we don't close, we don't go away. You know, we kind of stay with them until they say go away, unless, unless they say go away. Uh, but we have like a pressure washer. So if the guy's out there and he's pressure washing his house, you know, from, and his neighbor comes over and says, hey, where'd you get that? He says, well, Jerry Pincus, he's got that, uh, I bought the house with him. And so who do you think is going to get that sale or that potential to come up again when the neighbor just says, hey, got the pressure washer from the, from him? You know, he's going to tell his other neighbor about how great we are, you know. Um, so it's about staying relevant, staying in touch with them. And, you know, it's it's all the other things that we do. You know, we've got a meeting room if they want to use our meeting in our office. We bought our office building last year. Um, so we've got more space than we had previously, and um, we've got a second floor, and it's got a meeting area. So you know, hey, if you've got something, you want to meet some people, you got you know friends, whatever happening, you can use our space. We've got a little kitchenette up there, you know. And so what happens is we get even more exposure to more people, and um, it just is a snowball that keeps on rolling. Yeah. And uh, now we we I'll tell you what we did do. We we uh, Christmas cards. A lot of people will send Christmas cards and stuff like that. We sent a uh, Thanksgiving card out because we're thankful. Okay, a lot of people don't. They'll they'll get a Christmas card. A lot of realtors will. But um, it was a very soft sale. It was what we. It was a handwritten note. The power of the handwritten note is is you know what it's all about. You stay in front of them, and um, it's a personal communication. Nobody receives letters anymore. Um, and all of our agents sat down and we wrote these. This was one of our things that we have in our what we're going to do. Um, and and so they hit their database. And that took days. Don't it didn't happen. And everybody had writer's cramp. But um, the phones just. I mean, what do you think is going to happen? You know, people are definitely going to remember you. So. You know, you're doing you're doing the monthly newsletter. Are you pushing in the monthly newsletter? Hey, you know, we have this pressure washer. You can come and borrow. We have this moving truck. You can utilize our office space. I, and I see a lot of this. Uh, I, I'm seeing a little bit more, um, more and more of of, and it's huge value. You know, just offering just simple little things. It doesn't cost a lot of money, but just saying, hey, if you if you ever need a scanner or a printer. Yeah. or a shredder, you know, come into our exactly. office. And is that something that you're pushing every single month in the newsletter? We are, but we're not obnoxious with it. It's just a here's another perk, you know. And what we are pushing is um, that's value, and it's known because we'll have a magnet, for instance, that says of all of our raving fan stuff that that we have, we're getting magnets made as we speak, actually, that are gonna that's gonna say here's all the other stuff in addition to, and we're gonna send that in a letter, a year end letter. But hey, just in case you forgot. Um, but you know, there's other things in the newsletter like, um, hey, would you like to get our free report on blah blah blah. Hey, um, do you want our, our this, that, and the other, our booklet on this, that, and the other? You know, so again, you know, how to get more money for your house when you sell? Oh, yeah. I'm, well, then when they do that, then you kind of have an idea that maybe they're thinking about selling. So, uh, you know, it's just, it's the system on the system on the system. You know, you start getting really dialed in. Now, again, a lot of these people aren't here, so we have to get a lot more creative than, than the norm. You know, we have to communicate on a lot of different levels. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Now I, I dig it. And, and so many agents drop the ball there and it's, it's just, again, it's the systems like you talked about and it's such an easy thing to do. We just got to stay on top of it. So those are some awesome, awesome ideas. Um, so, um, let's dive into just, just for a moment on mindset, you know, so much of this business is, is mindset. You know, there's so many people that talk about, uh, um, well, it, it, let me back up. It's, it's, I find, I know we've had conversations. We were just in Kansas city together, you know, about 90% of this game being mindset. I know you and I even and had some conversations on, on meditation and different things that we do. You know, what, what are some different things that you do to control your mindset, to stay positive? I mean, you've been going at this now for, you know, nine years, looks like you sold well over 2000 homes. Um, you know, th this can be a burnout industry. You know, what are you doing to, to stay positive, to stay focused, um, to keep pushing, uh, and not just for yourself, but also your teammates. Well, teammates wise, I want to be around positive people. I be, I want to be around the right people. So I think from design standpoint, you kind of have to build it that way first. Okay. 
um, because I've had the other where people were not necessarily on my same wavelength. They're not tuned in. You know, they they're negative. They always like to go negative. I don't like to be around that. You know, they can go somewhere else. So first thing is is just being around positive people because you know everybody's going to take everybody up to the next level. That's the key to this whole thing. I want to be around positive people. I was in this major office before, um, and when I was learning, you know, the business and. I mean, they had like five offices and 250 agents, and they were just, it was just big. And I found pretty quick that people like to go negative, and I couldn't believe it because I was used to being, you know, a business owner and using all this, all these other things. I'm like, I can't, I can't be around this. So after I had like, let's see, I had three people, I went outside the office and actually told my broker what I was doing. I said, I'm going to have another office. I'm still affiliated with you. I'm not going anywhere. You're doing everything, but I can't be around all this water cooler talk, all this negative. And then, the other end of it was, you know, what are you doing all the time? Well, just, you know, you can't stop me because I'm on a mission here. You can't keep coming in my office, knocking the door, hey, you got a minute, you know? So that was one thing. So I, I, I kind of pulled my team away and then just constantly was filling with the positive, the good, and, and on a daily basis. What we all really need to do is because the world tends to go negative in a minute is to constantly be filling ourselves with the positive. So if you don't take the time to do that, you know, all this other crap just comes in, so you need to constantly be filling it. So, you know, I watch some, some. Uh, I'm always trying to learn something. So there's, if it's not something that I'm, uh, I don't know everything about everything. Every day I'm learning. You know, so I'm always looking to get some positive twist on something or hear it from a different perspective or a different view um, or learn something else. You know, constantly reading. I'm dyslexic. I mean, I just about made it out of school, but I love to read. You know, learn to learn to overcome. So you just figure it out. But if you don't put that positive stuff in there, you know, it may take me a little longer to get it done. I'm going to get it done now. Um, and I think just by having that mindset, because it is mindset, total mindset, if you can do it, it's going to happen. So you talked about hiring positive people. So so that must mean that, one, you have a, a very strong internal culture in your company. Um, number two, you must have a pretty dialed in hiring process to ensure that you're doing that. I mean, number one, how, are there qualifying questions or what do you put them through when you're interviewing people to ensure that they're, they're positive? And then um, on the back end of that, what are you guys doing with your culture to, to just keep that alive? And let me just say this. It is a very difficult thing to constantly maintain and it's just because we're dealing with people there's so many emotions during the day there's there's family lives there's stuff happening all the time so as a culture as a team we're working together so for instance we'll read books together all right so we read Darren Hardy's the compound effect and then we'll read a chapter and then we meet on a Wednesday sales meeting and we'll discuss what the last chapter was all about and then kind of pull out everybody's take on that so we're in a togetherness uh, you know, we're, we're all going through this together. You know, everybody's got problems, but let's try to figure it out. You know, we'll read a book. We'll, we'll talk about the good news. What, what did you learn? Um, so as a team, we're constantly trying to do things together like that. Now, everybody's kind of on their mission, and not everybody's in the office all the time, and they're out doing things, and we understand that's a business. But on a weekly basis, we try to get that together. So um, the hiring process, I'm, I'm hiring hustle. I'm hiring mindset. I'm not hiring ego. Um, I'm hiring people who probably um, with the right systems and the right uh, mindset can accomplish a lot more than they're accomplishing right now. And then there's gratefulness. Um, and so we kind of full package. I've had the other end. I've had top producers um, doing a lot of business. I, I I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, I let go one of my top producers this year, um, and it was and it was just because everything ended up being negative. And then you end up with everybody else kind of you know feeling crappy. And it was there was jealousy. Okay, they were jealous for other team members. Oh, you got that deal? Uh, you know, you should be happy. We got a bell in the office. Ding the damn bell. You know, be happy. So if somebody gets to that point, it's not what I want to be around. So they had to go. I uh, just recruited two agents. They'll be joining the team. And um, I'm excited because on Wednesday we'll be uh, going through a lot of stuff. What did I hire them on? I hired them on basically knowing them previously, uh, knowing a little bit about them um, before they even got in the office, did a little bit of research on them to figure them out. And then um, 
just sat down with them and told them that we're different. We're not like your other offices. This isn't. This doesn't fit everybody's. Just being right up front with them. Look, this does not fit everybody's. I, we could have an office with a bunch of agents. I, I take the approach that we'll have a handful and always will have a handful of agents doing hundreds of deals rather than hundreds of agents doing a handful of deals. You know, my, my, uh, my philosophy on that is just you know you don't need to to um, have the negatives and that's really the key to it is is you're going to have a few and then constantly having to weed out and so I'm just looking on the positives. Yep. Love it, man. So, um, and, and I know a lot of culture kind of, kind of boils down to as well as the types of goal setting that you do. So not just for yeah. yourself personally, but also your team. So walk us through that. I know we're, as this interview takes place, we're what, a couple weeks away from the end of the year. Um, right. so, so what do you personally do for goal setting, um, setting personal goals, business goals, and then how do you walk your team to that goal setting as well? Okay. So we, we, did this last week. We sat in a group session with the team and we're talking about, first off, the vision. I'm, I'm telling people where we're going and what we're doing. So everybody's coming along, okay? And that may be culture as well, but, um, you know, setting expectations and talk about personal goals, you know, um, trips that people want to take. You know, so and so wants to go on a cruise this year, so and so wants to do this, you know, keeping each other on task because they know that somebody wants to go do this as a team member, you know, cheering them on, making sure, hey, you're going to hit that goal, right? Hey, how far away are you from doing that, you know? Um, and so it's just kind of everybody wins and everybody comes along. And so we look at last year's numbers and we focus on what we're doing this year and the changes that we're making because, you know, not everything works, obviously. There's things that you need to stop doing or correct or redo or implement so there's always those things that you have to do, but um, we look at last year's numbers. We look at where we're going, what, what our feelings are, and that sort of thing. Realistically, not being, hey, I want 50 jillion, bajillion dollars. You know, it's just not going to happen. What am I going to give up to get that? But put it in writing so that when it's in writing and we look at it all the time individually, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to have the individual meeting with each one. That's in a group session. And then, then we sit down. We have the individual meetings on uh, with each each team member, and uh, just go through and talk about needs, wants, and and how to get there. Map it out. How often do you do the? I know, I know, weekly you do the the sales meetings. How often do you do the one on ones? Quarterly. Okay. Perfect. Um, so you know, gosh, I know you've had so much success, and you, and you really had success. A lot of people hearing this call are thinking, okay. The, the, this dude got out of his, his last business, came out first year in the business, crushed 50 deals, started stacking on there, 52,000 leads in your database, which is just still is freaking blowing my mind right now. Uh, you know, but, but I know a lot of people that hear this sit there and think, God, you know, you got to be superhuman. Um, you know, and, and I always say in this business so, or just in life, like we're, we're so such thing as a failure. We, we're either learning um, we're succeeding or, or, or we're growing or we're learning. Right. So I know you've had all these successes. We've talked a lot about, about these today. Um, but let's talk about some of your failures or some, some of your biggest learning experiences. You know, what, what have been some of the biggest learning experiences that you've had that have really truly helped you grow, adapt and become so uh, successful in this business? Well, um, probably not doing or dropping things quicker and hanging on for too long. Okay. Um, it's all about, you know, you try to get something out of something. If you make an investment, whether it's time, energy, and it can be in anything, you can equate this to anything, you know, and you hang on too long, um, it, it, it can hurt you. Okay, so what I, what I would say to do, and I, um, one, of the, one of the things I learned per, pretty early on, if you want to be really efficient, and I learned this back in furniture days, is what is, ask yourself the question, is, what is the most important thing that I need to be doing right now? Okay, and so that'll tell you where you're going and what you're doing. But then the second thing is, is what is not working? Okay, people will always focus on what is working or how can I implement more things or get myself, and then they get themselves bogged down. But the point is, is to ask yourself what's not working, okay, and focus on those things because that is the stuff that slows you down. You can, you know, you can implement a lot of stuff, and I'm I'm crazy on the implementation, and I think that is the key to it. But um, and the mindset. But if you if you have an agent that's not doing what you want to do, and they're on your team, I know you know if you're growing a team and you're thinking about growing a team, you know, make sure that you're trying to get the right mix or an admin. You know, these are the first hires. 
um, they pretty much have to be like-minded with you because this is your main. This is this is where you're going. If you're at the point where you you are not there and you're just starting in the business, focus on what brings you the most return on your investment. Okay, because those are the things that you should be doing on a daily basis. If you're not focused on those things, then you get off doing something else. Uh, you know, time wasting. Um, we all do it. You know, you can only be so efficient. And if you can, if you can get even more efficient and time block, which I like to do uh, during the day, is you know figure out what it is that I need to get done. Have my goals. I've got my top and five list. Here's what I'm going to get done today, and then uh, marching on to the next. Yeah, you know, I love that. Not dropping uh, certain things fast enough. You know, Seth Godin has an awesome book out there called The Dip, and it talks about successful people know when to quit. You know, so so we have it so ingrained in our, our head that oh, successful people never quit and they keep grinding and moving forward. And yeah, I mean, they they do. They 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 out persist and out fail and you know everybody else out there. However, they also know when to quit. You know, if you're doing something that's not working, you got to know when to cut that cord. And man, I've been so guilty of that myself. Um, and we I think all. a lot of that comes down to just tracking, right? Like we need, we really yeah. need to be tracking our stuff and just paying attention and, and daily reflection. Um, yeah. Yeah. Look, and this is the thing, and you mentioned this too, is, is, um, you say this guy is, you know, he's got all this stuff going on. It didn't just happen. I just want you to understand that, you know, if I can do this, you can do this. I, you know, again, this is the thing. If you set your mind to something, it's going to happen. You just need to be persistent at it and just constantly be working at it, grinding it every single day because it will happen. Everything else is going to move out of the way because if you if you are constantly focused on one thing, not one thing, but multiples, but if you're focused on that, you're going to get there. If you start falling off track, get yourself back on because believe me, there's during the day, during the year, during the month, in the past, there's a million things that can get me off track. I had my pity party for a little while. Let's move forward. Yep, love it, man. So what's uh, I know you got a, a ton going on, but what's uh, what's next for you and your team? Well, um, we got we got a lot of stuff going. I've just like I had mentioned, I just added two buyers agents to the team. I'm really excited about that, bringing them online. Um, I, I believe they're full of promise. So again, this is a, a compounding for us. Um, I've got uh, coaching clients, which I've added been adding more coaching clients, and uh, it's just a lot of stuff happening this year. I'm just looking forward to it. I, I'm one of my goals is to write another book. You know, I've got a lot of things on the list. It's a matter of just getting them done. Um, I, I uh, I'm just looking to to get more efficient, constantly be getting more efficient, and constantly be using the resources that we're using. And um, that is a that's that's the big goal for the year. Yep. Awesome, brother. Awesome. So uh, before before we wind up the call here, you know, and, and our listener base on these calls are everybody from from top mega agent team leaders to brand new agents getting the business to successful independent agents to, to owner brokers. Um, so any last words for our listeners that you feel they should hear to help them, uh, especially as, as we're winding down 2014, getting into 2015 here, you know, any last words to, to help them get out there, just crush it, take their business to a whole new level? Um, yeah, I, I would say, you know, each of us, because of our experiences in life, has a different thought process or a different background or the way we would, you know, act or react, okay? So, but we all know a lot of stuff. We've learned a lot of stuff, right? And um, it's all gotten us to this point where we are today, Okay, whether that's good, bad, or indifferent. Okay, but you got to take that knowledge, and you got to do something with it. It's not, you know, a lot of people say knowledge is power, or they say that you know, content is power. The ultimate power is implementation. That is the power. If we know everything and we don't implement, it's a waste. If we took the time to learn something and we didn't implement, it's a waste. If we take the time to implement and then don't follow through and consistently follow through, it's a waste. So implementation is the power. And um, you know, if you can implement faster or more than your competitor, you're absolutely going to crush it and you're going to dominate. And that's what I hope all of you do. Yeah, no, I love it, man. And, and it's it's funny, you know, so something that we talk a lot about when I end these calls with, uh, you know, all you can have all the knowledge in the world, but without without taking action implementation, it's it's really knowledge without uh, without implementation's delusion. And so, Jerry, you and I were just uh, in Kansas City um, at a conference where we were just got a lot of, I mean, a ton of great ideas. 
and we're texting each other back and forth and emailing each other back and forth on what we were implementing. And, and we spent a lot of time uh, before the conference was even, even over about, hey, what, what are those nuggets that we're going to implement right now to, to crush our business to the next level? So those listening to this call, you know, take, take Jerry's word, to, you know, words to heart. I mean, success didn't happen on accident. I mean, this is a guy that has not only been licensed for about nine years, 57,000 leads, sold well over 2,000 homes, one of the top guys on the planet, um, million YouTube views, known in the authority figure, out there publishing books. I mean, he's doing it on a massive, massive level. So make sure that you're taking uh, this knowledge and, and, and doing something with it. Don't let it sit in a drawer, take massive levels of action, go out there and crush it. And uh, before this call, Jerry and I were talking about doing, um, here in the first quarter, a live webinar for any listener on this uh, this program that wants to jump onto it. We'll, we'll offer it out to, to all of our listeners here of a, of a live webinar of showing, okay, here, here's exactly how you do a Facebook lead and kind of showing more in depth. It's kind of hard to uh, talk about some of this stuff with not having those visuals. So we're looking forward to that. And uh, yeah, Jerry, I know your time is busy, man. Greatly honor, respect, and appreciate you being on the show. I know our listeners do as well. Um, and you guys, again, take this information, implement, take massive levels of action, go out there, crush it, and uh, keep dominating. And again, Jerry, we thank you so much, my friend. Appreciate you. Thanks. Yeah, you got it, my brother. Thank you for listening. Do not forget to follow me on Facebook, Joshua Smith GSD, on Twitter, at Joshua Smith GSD, Instagram, Joshua Smith GSD. Make sure to also subscribe to my YouTube channel. Type in Joshua Smith, and I'm the good looking cat at the top. If you haven't already, go to www.joshuasmithgsd.com and subscribe to our email list. You'll get these interviews sent to you via email, along with my blog, videos, updates, and all that other fun shit. As always, make sure you're taking action. Take all this golden information that that, uh, you're getting delivered here and make sure you're applying it. Information without implementation is the start of delusion. So implement. Take massive levels of action. Get your hustle on. Get into GSD mode and go dominate. Peace out, guys, and see you next time.